This hope conference will now be recorded. <laughs> okay. I hope everyone's had a wonderful time, wonderful um, week. It's been a busy week for me. Um, I am actually about to be in the middle of finals for my one class that I'm taking. And I have to finish up a paper this weekend on top of all of the work stuff that we're doing. By the way, we're getting ready to transition to Epic. Is there a lot of you who are currently using Epic as your EMR? Anybody on the call? Yes. Sylvia said yes. And do you guys, do you like it, Sylvia? CNIF? Do you like Bugsy? I love it, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited too for the change, so we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, guys, so we are on week 12, and I, I, I just feel like for some reason this group has just, with all of the conference shenanigans, with all of the breaks that we've taken, um, it's just taken us forever to get to week 12. So what I do want to remind you of is that there is an entire YouTube channel where you guys can access education, past recordings um, so if you are like if you have a test if you have the test that's coming up for you soon and you're like I can't wait for this group to do all of the lessons go ahead and listen to whatever is on there we also have the Google Drive so lots of different um, resources for you to have access to so what we're gonna be going over today is chapter 31 which is cleaning disinfection and sterilization which is a, an extremely 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 important chapter um, no joke the cleaning disinfection and sterilization section when I first took the test um, back in 2017 it was one of the most difficult areas of the exam for me because working at the health department, I didn't have a lot of opportunities to gain a better understanding of all that is cleaning disinfection and sterilization with, you know, your basic definitions, just your, just your, just in general. Everything for me was through text and through YouTube. I didn't have the, the, the ability to really truly experience it. So for my IPs that have access to a sterile processing department, that have access to an operating room, that have access to your operating room nurses orientation. So for most of your organizations, your OR nurses are having to go through an orientation process. Reach out to those educators, try to see if there's any way that you can get access. Um, obviously not to their entire orientation um, process, but even if you're just able to attend a couple, a couple of their days, maybe two days, uh, or whatever of their orientation, I think you'll be really surprised with the amount of information that you that you learn. Okay, so let's go over some definitions. Um, so we're going over criteria right now. We've got um, three different criteria for our devices, um, it, which is critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. So that those are your those are going to be your options, non-critical, semi-critical, or critical for the definitions below. So the first one is going to be items that contact sterile tissue, such as surgical instruments. So which which criteria? Linda's coming in hot. She is she was the first one to answer. Okay. And she is correct, it is critical. The second one is gonna be items that contact mucous membranes such as endoscopes. Linda, again, <laughs> she is not to be trifled with. Okay, so semi-critical. And then the very last one obviously is going to be our non-critical categories. So once again, for critical, it's items that contact sterile tissue such as surgical instruments. For semi-critical is gonna be items that contact mucous membranes, such as endoscopes, and for non-critical is going to be devices that contact only intact skin, such as stethoscopes. Now, this is all part of a criteria. So what criteria is this? The blank divides medical equipment into three categories based on risk of critical, semi-critical, and non-critical, and continues to be the primary principle that guides disinfection and sterilization processes. All right. Very good, you guys. All right, 
I don't even need to teach this class. Everybody's already answering it correctly. It's the Spalding classification system. Yes, it's your Spalding classification. That's what um, that's what we're going to really be paying attention to today um, for the first portion of this is our spalding classifications going over decontamination and gaining a better understanding of the cleaning disinfection um, and sterilization section there is an entire um, there's an entire couple of weeks that we'll be dedicating to this but this is just a very important chapter and I feel like it provides you a lot of understanding and it gives you a lot of um, knowledge that you'll need for this section of of the test. So environmental decontamination plays an important role in decreasing bio burden, which may help lower rates of HAIs. Environmental surfaces include non-critical items as designated by the Spalding classification system, as well as high touch surfaces as countertop bed rails and tray tables. Okay, so let me see if I can make this a little bit smaller. Um, all right, so we're gonna be talking about methods of um, disinfection and sterilization of patient care items and environmental surfaces. So this is table 31.1, and this is methods for disinfection and sterilization of patient care items and environmental surfaces. So for sterilization, and this is why I believe it's extremely important to get experience. If you have the opportunity, I am telling you, reach, reach out, that's gonna be my challenge for next week. Email your SPD leader, your manager, your director over sterile processing department and say, hey, is it okay if I spend two hours with your team? An hour, three hours, however much time you have to just go and learn about their processes because all of this information that you're seeing on this chart becomes so much more meaningful when you actually get to see the processes that people follow. So sterilization, you're gonna have um, different methods. You're going to have your high temperature, your low temperature, and then your liquid immersion. And it's very important to know what these three different um, what these three different methods of sterilization are. And I know that it's just being referred to as like high temperature, low temperature, liquid immersion, which is great. But when you're going into your sterile processing department, what type of equipment are you using? Do you use a sterad? Do you have washer disinfectors? Do you have um, um, ultrasonic cleaners? What do you do for your for your heat sensitive devices? What does your low temperature um, sterilization process look like? What area is it done in? All of these things are really important to understand. And you can read this over and over and over again, but until you try to get a better understanding, either through um, you know YouTube videos or actually going out and experiencing it, it's gonna be a lot harder for you to remember. Like, I know my low temps, I'm thinking of my sterads. Um, I'm, I can picture all of these different areas in my head of our sterile processing department as I'm talking to you about it. So for our sterilization, it's going to destroy all microorganisms, including bacterial spores. High temp, we're thinking about steam, um, which is about 40 minutes, dry heat, one to six hours, depending on the temperature. And these are going to be for heat tolerant, critical surgical instruments um, and semi-critical patient care items, depending, depending. That all depends, okay, on, on your facility uh, and the IFUs the instructions for use. Low temperature, ethylene oxide gas, hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, ozone, hydrogen peroxide vapor, and these are going to be for your heat sensitive critical items and semi-critical patient care items. And then lastly, your liquid immersion where you're going to be dealing with your chemical sterilins. Again, these are for heat sensitive critical items and semi-critical patient care items that can be immersed. There are pros and cons. Um, there are there are so many details for these each different each different type of sterilization that you use, um, but at minimum you should have a broad understanding of the different of the different methods that are available. For high level disinfection, this is going to destroy all microorganisms except numbers of bacterial spores, which is going to be um, heat automated, and then there's liquid immersion. So you've got pasteurization, and then you've got chemical sterilants um, uh, with high level disinfection, and they go over entire lists. One of the things that you do need to be familiar with is for the test, what I have noticed is that they do like to make sure that you're familiar with your high level disinfectants, um, any type of liquid. So they wanna wanna make sure that you understand um, 
what are some of the uh, risks of using them and what type of potential harmful effects they can have on team members or staff who are using them. Okay, for your, um, there's intermediate level, which destroys vegetative bacteria, mycobacteria, most viruses, most fungi, but not bacterial spore, which is liquid contact, um, and then low level disinfection, which destroys vegetative bacteria, some fungi and viruses, but not mycobacteria or spores. And then they go over how you're gonna wanna make sure that, and, and you see that these two criteria are gonna fall under the non-critical, um, under the non-critical, um, classification from Spalding and they're talking about EPA registered hospital disinfectants and the difference between them. So this one, the low level is going to have no tuberculocidal claim um, and it's giving you examples, chlorine-based products, phenolics, improved hydrogen peroxide, quaternary ammonium compounds with exposure times of at least one minute. Okay, so we just went over these definitions. So the first one is going to be just <laughs> I can't talk today. I'm so sorry. The first one is destroys all microorganisms except high numbers of bacterial spores. Destroys all microorganisms except high numbers of bacterial spores. Which one is that going to be? Very good for those who put high level disinfection. Okay, um, destroys all microorganisms, including bacterial spores. Very good for those who put sterilization. Next is destroys vegetative bacteria, some fungi and viruses, but not mycobacteria or spores. Give you two seconds to think about it. Okay, that's going to be low level disinfection. And then the last one is going to be destroys vegetative bacteria, mycobacteria, most viruses, most fungi, but not bacterial spores. All right, cleaning. This is extremely important. Oh my goodness, I cannot. I cannot, cannot, cannot emphasize the importance of cleaning. The cleaning process for critical and semi-critical devices should begin as soon as possible after use. As soon as possible after use, okay? What does that mean? That means that we should not have equipment, devices, instruments, whatever you want to use, whatever term you want to use, sitting and just waiting to be reprocesses, reprocessed. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. My brain is just wild today. It must be because it's Friday. So that means that when you're observing in your operating rooms or when you're observing an endoscopy procedure or when um, even in the emergency department, so some of your emergency departments may actually be using um, instruments from sterile processing. They should immediately be getting sprayed down with an enzymatic cleaner. They should be ge they should be getting cleaned throughout the procedure to make sure that bio burden is not adhering to it, caking on it, and drying. So gross debris should be removed by wiping or irrigation as uh, as indicated by the instrument manufacturer's instructions for use. Removal, removal of gross contamination prevents the drying of blood and tissue, reduces the bio burden and nutrient material on medical instruments, and reduces the possibility of spillage or aerosolizing of contaminants into the environment. And you're going to find a lot of opportunities for this specific step across all different levels of care, whether it's acute care, long-term care, um, and ambulatory care. There's a lot of opportunities for um, better high-level disinfection and sterilization processes that happen in ambulatory sites. So these are all things that you need to that you need to keep in mind. You know, you should not be walking into SPD with a bunch of instruments that have dried blood on it that have been sitting there for a while, or in you know, depending on where where you're storing it in your um, 
ambulatory sites. These are things that you need to keep in mind for when you're going around and when you're doing your audits. If soiled material be materials become dried or baked onto the instruments, the removal process becomes more difficult and the disinfection or sterilization process becomes less effective or ineffective. Instruments should be kept moist after the initial removal of gross contamination and prior, and prior to transport for additional cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. This can be a uh, this can be accomplished by using special containers, a pretreatment product, or towels moistened with water, but not saline. Why can we not use saline on our instruments? There's one specific word I'm looking for. And it starts with a C. <laughs> yes. Good job, Rebecca. Yes, it's corrosive. It's corrosive. It's going to damage, it's going to damage our um our instruments. So please make sure that you're not using saline. So big thing, if it's not clean, it's not sterile. And that is point blank matter of fact. You cannot deny it. So you know, one of the things that I learned while working in SPD. So when, here's the thing about me. I'm very self-aware when it comes to my knowledge. I know that there are certain areas that of, of infection prevention that I know very well and that I'm very proud of knowing. But a couple of years ago, um, this was, I mean, just last year, I felt like this was one of the areas that I didn't understand. And so in order to deal with that, I'm not going to, I'm not just going to take the easy way out and say, okay, well, I'm not, I'm just not going to know about it or I'm not going to learn about it. Um, I'm going to do everything possible that I can to learn about it, which is why I spent time with the sterile processing department. And I remember, you know, we would have um, our trays get dropped off at SPD. They go through the decontamination process, the manual cleaning process, the washer disinfectors, and they get to the clean area. And our policy is if for any reason in any of these steps, in any of these processes, either through the manual cleaning, uh, that decontam process, through the washer disinfector, if a tray makes it to the clean area and we find contamination. So it could be a little bit of cement glue on a ortho tray. It could be a little tiny 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 piece of um the most tiniest piece of tissue as you're looking under the magnifying glass that entire tray has to be completely completely cleaned once again um, from the beginning beginning to end and so all of these things are really important because if an instrument isn't clean if your trays are not clean then they cannot be sterilized appropriately and this slide is extremely important. It's a very, very important aspect of infection prevention. Cleaning and rinsing is the most important step in the reusable medical equipment process. Cleaning reduces the bio burden and removes foreign material, organic residue, and inorganic salts that interferes with the sterilization process by acting as a barrier to the sterilization agent. So you gotta get out there, you gotta look at your trays, see what's being dropped off at SPD and um, the other thing is really recognizing just the amount of expertise and the amount of knowledge that you already have in your facilities and for my people that are working with like the with with um, the Department of Health if you're public health and let's say you don't necessarily have access to a sterile processing department a lot of you have relationships with local hospitals. We have observer programs. We have um, where you can come in and just fill out, you know, and, and observe just for a day. Reach out, try to get those opportunities so that you can get the knowledge that you need to be uh, the best infection preventionist and public health professional that you can be. So decontamination, so decontam. Reusable items should be transported from the point of use to the reprocessing area in closable, puncture resistant, leak proof containers. Ooh, someone's not muted. Let me see you all. Okay, um, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, but back to the decontamination. Reusable items should be transported from the point of use to the reprocessing area in closable, puncture-resistant, leak-proof container 
containers that are properly marked as biohazard. Standard precautions should always be adhered to when handling contaminated medical equipment. You shouldn't be transporting um, your surgical items in like wrap towels. You shouldn't just be, you know, just transporting things in inappropriate containers. Please make sure that um, your all of your areas have appropriate containers for transporting your instruments. Contaminated, contaminated items should be transported to a decontamination area where they must be thoroughly cleaned and decontaminated using water with detergents or enzymatic cleaners. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. Okay, so instrument cleaning. So you've got manually and then that mechanical unit. So for manually, the two essential components are friction and fluidics. Using friction, um, rubbing, scrubbing the soiled area with a brush is an old and dependable method. Fluidics is fluids under pressure and it's used to remove soil and debris from internal channels after brushing and when the design does not allow the passage of a brush through a channel. So um, when you get into a sterile processing department, this happened to me when I was first when I was first learning about just the decontam process. There are pedals on for at least for my department. There are pedals on the ground that control your um, your fluidics, like the the hose that does the high pressure water to flush your instruments and you know um, instruments with like lumens, small. Um, all of, all of their their little intricacies and I remember um, it's very important very important that you're paying attention to your hands and that you are having the hose underwater especially when you're cleaning when you're brushing um, all of that should be happening underwater to prevent aerosolization but I remember I was not holding on to one of the um, the hoses too tight and it actually like hopped out of the water um, and splashed me <laughs> so so I'm telling you all of these things you you really learn by by getting in there lots of mistakes can happen um, that's why we have to make sure that that our um, staff in SPD are wearing all of their personal protective equipment and then for your mechanical unit you're going to have ultrasonic cleaners or washer disinfectors when using a washer disinfector care should be taken as to the method of loading those instruments the loading process is extremely, extremely important. Hinged instruments should be opened fully to allow adequate contact with the detergent solution. The stacking of instruments and washers should be avoided and instruments should be disassembled as much as possible so that as it's going through that washer disinfector, it can get into all of the nooks and crannies. So here we've got our mechanical or automatic cleaners. Um, you've got your ultrasonic cleaning, which removes soil by a process called cavitation. This is important for you to remember. Um, I feel like they really like to make sure that you understand some of the mechanics behind the the sterilization processes. And I've and I've. I just know that you have to remember that cavitation is associated with your ultrasonic cleaners, so remember that. Um, so, process called cavitation and implosion in which waves of acoustic energy are propagated in aqueous solutions to disrupt the bonds that hold particulate matter to surfaces. Users of ultrasonic cleaners should be aware that the cleaning fluid could result in endotoxic contamination of surgical instruments that could cause severe inflammatory reactions. If you've got dental clinics, very important that you're keeping an eye on your ultrasonic cleaners um, and obviously in hospitals make sure you're keeping an eye on your ultrasonic cleaners but especially with your ambulatory sites you have to keep an eye out for what's what's going on with your reprocessing your washer decontaminators slash disinfectors act like a dishwasher that uses a combination of water circulation and detergents to remove soil these units sometimes have a cycle that subjects that subjects the instrument to a heat process and it's going to depend on the type of machine that you have um, and what's going on. Mechanical or automatic cleaners. So washer sterilizers are modified steam sterilizers that clean by filling the chamber with water and detergent through which steam is passed to provide agitation. Instruments are subsequently rinsed and subjected to a short steam sterilization cycle. Another washer sterilizer employs rotating spray arms for a wash cycle followed by a steam sterilization cycle at 285 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you've got your washer pasteurizers. These you will find in uh, respiratory departments. 
very frequently, washer pasteurizers expose instruments to hot water for 30 minutes at a temperature of 70 degrees um, Celsius and are typically, sorry, not, yes, Celsius, and are typically used in the reprocessing of respiratory therapy equipment. Critical items. All right, critical items are objects or instruments that must be free of any microorganisms, including bacterial spores, when they enter sterile tissue, bone, or the vascular system in order not to introduce microorganisms into the site, resulting in an infection or disease. This category is going to include surgical instruments, cardiac and urinary catheters, implants, and ultrasound probes used in sterile body cavities. The items in this category should be purchased as sterile or be steam sterilized prior to use. Steam sterilization under pressure is one of the oldest and most effective methods for sterilization and is the preferred method for the sterilization of critical medical equipment. Now, it is the preferred method. The thing about steam sterilization that you have to remember, and this is why that chart that we were looking at um, before is very important. I don't know how to get to it, but is that it's high heat. The temperature is high. So even though it is the preferred method, you have to remember that the reason why we have these different categories for um, sterilization, where you've got that high heat, then you've got low heat for those heat sensitive items, is because it all boils down to your instructions for use. It all boils down to your instructions for use and the device that you are reprocessing. And that's going through the reprocessing um, cycles. It can be preferred, but that doesn't mean that every single device or instrument that um, that you need to put through a sterilization cycle can go in a steam sterilizer. If the item is heat sensitive and cannot be steam sterilized, the object may be sterilized with ethylene oxide, which lots of issues with ETO, hydrogen peroxide gas, pa gas plasma, ozone, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, or liquid chemical sterilins. Um, so liquid chemical sterilins, with the exception of 0.2% paracetic acid, have indicated exposure times that range from 3 to 12 hours. All right, another limitation to the use of chemical um, sterilins is that the devices cannot be wrapped during processing, creating a challenge for maintaining sterility after processing and during storage. Devices require rinsing following processing with liquid chemical sterilants. The type of water, either sterile or filtered, should be determined by the manufacturer's instructions for use with both the device and the liquid chemical being used. And due to the inherent limitations of using liquid chemical sterilants for sterilization, their use should be restricted to reprocessing critical devices that are heat sensitive and incompatible with other sterilization methods. All right, semi-critical items. Semi-critical items are those that come into contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin. This category includes respiratory therapy and anesthesia equipment, gastrointestinal endoscopes, bronchoscopes, laryngoscopes, esophageal manometry probes, um, anorectal manometry catheters, endocavitary probes, rectal and vaginal probes, prostate and biopsy probes, um, infrared coagulation devices and diaphragm fitting rings. The thing that's challenging about this specific um, classification is that you have to remember a lot of different devices and for the exam they do expect you to have some level of understanding of the different um, types of reprocessing that is available to do that. And so personally, this is just one of the areas that I had to pay a lot of attention to and make sure that I read over and that I wasn't confusing my different types of, of devices for this criteria, for, for this section of the Spalding classification system. Um, oh, also, interesting. 
interesting story here. Please make sure that you're paying attention to your diaphragm rings in the outpatient setting and whether you and whether they are being reprocessed appropriately and even if they need to be reprocessed because some of these are have been made to be single use. Pay attention to that. There may be some gaps there. <laughs> Semi-critical items. These medical devices should be free of all microorganisms. Um, that is mycobacteria, fungi, viruses, and bacteria, although small numbers of bacterial spores may be present. Intact mucous membranes, such as those of the lungs or the GI tract, generally are resistant to infection by common bacterial spores, but are susceptible to other organisms, such as bacteria, mycobacteria, and viruses. Semi-critical items minimally require high-level disinfection using chemical disinfectants. So that's going to be glutaraldehyde, hydrogen peroxide, ortho methaldehyde, improved hydrogen peroxide, parasitic acid with hydrogen peroxide, and chlorine-based products that are cleared by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and are dependable high-level disinfectants provided the correct, the correct parameters for time and temperatures are met. This is another opportunity for when you're conducting audits. First things first, don't feel like you have to be um, you know, an expert on these things. It takes time to learn them and it takes time to be familiar. At minimum, try to get familiar with the with the different types of chemicals that are being used at your facility. Um, and one of the first places or one of the first ways that I started to become more involved with sterile processing was just by reaching out to that, to, um, it's Leroy, his name's Leroy, he's amazing. <laughs> And I was like, hey, is it okay if I get a tour of the department? I'm just trying to learn a little bit more about what you guys do here. Um, and then that started this whole thing. And look at me, now I'm CRCST, I got my certification. And that was a lot of hard work um, and a lot of just really, really great mentorship that I, uh, that I got from the team from our sterile processing team. So audits, audits of reprocessing of semi-critical devices. Staff should receive competency training and evaluation on the safe use and reprocessing of the equipment. Infection prevention rounds or audits should be conducted at least annually in all clinical areas that reprocess critical and semi-critical devices to ensure adherence to the reprocessing standards and policies. Results of infection prevention rounds should be provided to the unit managers. Deficiencies in reprocessing should be corrected and the corrective measures should be documented to infection prevention with a few days after um, after rounding based on facility policy and procedure. Non-critical items. So non-critical item, non-critical patient care items are those that come in contact with intact skin but not mucous membranes. Intact skin acts as an effective barrier to most microorganisms. Um, therefore, the sterility of items coming in contact with intact skin is not critical. Non-critical items can be divided into two categories. So non-critical patient care equipment such as stethoscopes, bedpans, blood pressure cuffs, crutches, bed rails, poles, monitors, wheelchairs, and linens, and then the non-critical environmental surfaces like counters, sinks, bedside tables, patient furniture, and floors. Um, this, um, I'm so sorry, can you please, guys, just give me one second. Okay. So sorry. So, so local versus central reprocessing area. Um, in general, central processing areas offer several advantages to include validated and reprocessing equipment, such as washer disinfectors, and persons that specialize in instrument reprocessing, preferably certified instrument reprocessing technicians. 
local reprocessing offers the advantages of faster instrument turnaround, less instrument loss, and lower instrument inventory. In one study, instruments reprocessed by the central decont decontamination unit had significantly less residual protein by the local decont de decontamination unit. Periodic inspections for quality and infection prevention purposes are recommended for all areas where equipment is reprocessed. Okay, next we're going to be started getting started with biofilms. Okay, so biofilms. Biofilms are microbial masses attached to surfaces that are immersed in liquids. Once these masses are formed, microbes may be resistant to the disinfectants by multiple mechanisms, including higher resistance of older biofilms, genotypic variation of the bacteria, microbial production of neutralizing enzymes, and physiologic gradients within the biofilm. Bacteria within biofilms are up to a thousand times more resistant to antimicrobials than the same bacteria in suspension, and biofilms have been found in whirlpools, dental unit water lines, and numerous medical devices like contact lenses, pacemakers, hemodialysis systems, urinary catheters, central venous catheters, and endoscopes. Um, Biofilms, let me tell you something. I have a deep love and passion for biofilms. Um, I know it's very odd, but I just, I find biofilms fascinating. They, and I think this all goes back to my first love, which is um, producing pseudomonas. Okay, my, my very first large healthcare associated outbreak was Vim producing pseudomonas at an LTAC. And it's it's essentially the reason for why I'm an infection preventionist now. It's what led me to infection prevention, and so um, and so it's just it's just so amazing. So you've got a single free floating little bacteria. It lands on the surface. Then bacterial cells aggregate and attach. You have growth and division of bacteria for that biofilm formation, and then you've got mature biofilm formation. And these are entire so biofilm are just like these entire little areas. Um, I remember Dr. Dr. Palmore was like, oh, they're partying in the pipes <laughs> because we talk a lot about um, biofilms in, in piping. So yes, they, they, they have parties in this biofilm because it's this nutrient rich area where the bacteria are just thriving and having a wonderful time. So this is when parts of biofilm disperse to release free floating bacteria um, and then can further colonize some issues. All right, so toxic interior segment syndrome. We briefly talked about this um, previously about um, TASS. So toxic interior segment syndrome is an acute non-infectious inflammatory reaction of the anterior chamber or segment of the eye that typically occurs 12 to 48 hours after an uneventful cataract surgery. Common symptoms include blurry vision, redness of the eye, ocular pain, corneal edema, and severe inflammation that is limited to the anterior segment. Symptoms often mimic those of infectious bacterial endothelmitis. However, TASS symptoms improve after the administration of topical or oral steroids. Now, this is important. We covered some of this during the last time, but I always tell you guys, be, please be familiar with what the APIC text, the two largest reference sets where you're going to have questions from your tests are going to be the APIC text and it's going to be the CDC guidelines. So a variety of substances that can enter the eye during or after surgery, as well as breaches in sterilization and disinfection of intraocular surgical instruments have been implicated as causes of um, TASS. These substances include detergent residues, topical ophthalmic ointments and salt solutions, antiseptic agents, talc from gloves, water bath con contaminants, impurities of autoclave steam, heat-stable endotoxins, and irritants on the surfaces of intraocular surgical instruments. Early identification of TASS for single cases as well as outbreaks requires the implementation of surveillance systems involving surgical staff, infection prevention, and cleaning and sterilization personnel. Guys, give me two seconds.
Okay, I've got something going on in the ICU, so we're going to have to end early today. I'm just going to go through these slides real quick. Um, five more minutes. Okay, human papillomavirus. So HPV, human papillomavirus is an extremely common sexually acquired infection and is considered the cause of cervical cancer with approximately 70% of cervical cancers being attributed to two types of HPV, HPV 16 and HPV 18. A recent study showed that a considerable number of endovaginal ultrasound probes were contaminated with HPV, 28% um, pre-examination. Endovaginal ultrasound probes are semi-critical items, even if covered with a sheath or probe cover. And for some locations, they'll just use a condom. Um, they'll, they'll have some sort of cover for them. Um, but this is very important information, specifically for those of you who have GYN services or who have ultrasound services where you are using these um, probes. Um, HPV contamination or endovaginal probes can occur regardless of sheath or probe cover usage, which is why it's very important that you have good processes in place. Um, inactivation of creutzfeldt jakob disease, so CJD. Since um, CJD agent is not readily inactivated by conventional disinfection and sterilization procedures, and because of the invariably fatal outcome of CJD, the procedures for disinfection and sterilization of the CJD prion have been both conservative and controversial for many years. On the basis of scientific data, only critical and semi-critical devices contaminated with high-risk tissue, um, such as brain, spinal cord, and eye tissue from high-risk patients, known or suspected infection with CJD or other prion diseases require special prion reprocessing. A moist environmental post-contamination reduces the attachment of both protein and prion amyloid to the stainless steel surface, so maintaining moist conditions at the point of use is critical. Now, we're not going to go over um, the, the full inactivation of, um, of CJD. May you, you might have a question on it, but you're going to have to read on this one, okay? Um, just because I'm almost out of time. Endoscopes. Endoscopes are another... Um, okay, I found some of my endoscopy questions challenging, and the main reason was that before my test, I really didn't have what I ha what I did was I watched a lot of videos on YouTube about endoscope reprocessing and endoscopy. I didn't really have the opportunity to um, do any hands-on work or get to shadow somebody doing it. It was all just trying to learn from Olympus or other places <laughs> that had education online. Um, but you can still do it, it's just gonna take a little bit more repetition and reading and learning and watching. So in general, endoscope disinfection or sterilization with a liquid chemical sterilant or high level disinfection involve five steps after you do your leak testing. So clean, mechanically clean internal and external surfaces, including brush and inter brushing internal channels and flushing each channel with water and an enzymatic cleaner. Disinfect. Immerse the endoscope in high-level disinfectant or chemical sterilant and perfuse um, disinfectant into all accessible channels such as suction, biopsy channel, and air or water channels and expose for a time recommended for specific products. Rinse. You need to rinse the endoscope and all channels with sterile water, filtered water, um, or tap water. You need to dry. Rinse the insertion. Um, tube and inner channels with alcohol and dry with forced air after disinfection and before storage. And lastly, for storage, store the es store the endoscope in a way that prevents recontamination and promotes and promotes drying, such as being hung vertically. Now, since this work has been published, there have been some advances that have been made in our endoscope um, storage process. There are some. Uh, who is it? I wonder. Is it? Which company is it that makes the horizontal ones with, that has the continuous air? Is it Cantel? It's not Cantel, is it? Oh, it might be Cantel. I can't remember, um, but there have been some um, some updates into how, how they've developed their equipment so that you can um, have that forced air running through the running through the device. So there have been made, some advances have been made. Um, we still store our endoscopes by hanging them vertically. Um, and that's 
that's where we're going to stop for today. Um, I am sorry that I do have to finish 10 minutes early, but there is something that I need to take care of here on campus. Um, so I hope that this was helpful. Let me see if I can skip ahead to, I don't know, last? No. Let me see if I can. I was going to go over some environmental cleaning, um, but we do not have time. So next week, we're going to be starting on employee and occupational health. And there's quite a bit of information. The thing about the employee and occupational health section is that you really have to make sure that you read all of their chapters. It's not as many, it's not as many chapters as the previous um, uh, what categories. It's not really categories, the way that the test is divided. Um, it's not as many chapters as the previous components, but it's still quite a bit of reading. So please make sure that you keep this in mind as you prepare. Um, thank you guys for joining me this Friday. Really greatly appreciate it. I hope that you learned a little bit of something um, and try to get out there and learn some more from your serial processing departments, okay? Thank you so much and have a good weekend.